I want to welcome you to our New Life online service. And I'm so glad that you've chosen to join with us as we worship today and as we open God's word. Hey, make sure you go to our website, newlifecc.com. You can find out more about all that's happening around our Turlock and our Patterson campus. Go to newlifecc.com and you can find out more. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the like button. You can be notified when new services post. Hey, there's so much that God is doing around here. We'd love to invite you to be part of a live service. So again, go to our website. You can find out locations, times, all of those things. But now let's prepare our hearts and join in for all that God wants to do today. Well, good morning, church. Still morning. We're glad you're joining us this morning. We're going to sing a few songs of worship to the Lord. And I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad you're here. Most importantly, I'm glad God is here with us today. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for for this moment where we can commune together, we can be together, God, and we can focus our intention and our hearts on you. God, may we just hear you and see you with, not just in, not our outward eyes, but God, with the inward eyes. And expect you to be here this morning with us as we raise our hallelujahs and our amens. And all this is for you. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the
to get out your uh, note sheet. You can open it up there and you'll see uh, some of the blanks and you're going to be able to follow along here uh, today. If you have your Bibles, you ready for this? I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. If you have never been in church before, if you have never opened a Bible before, I'm betting you can find it because it is the first book of the Bible and the first chapter in the first book of the Bible. So I want you to get there and uh, we're gonna dive into this here uh, today. So have you ever been in a meeting, maybe at work or or maybe even a home meeting, you know, with your family or whatever, and somebody in the group says something, maybe asks a question, maybe makes a comment, and all of a sudden, the whole meeting gets hijacked going in a completely different direction. It's like, what do they call them? Like rabbit tra- trails or going down the rabbit hole. Have you ever been in a meeting that just suddenly goes sideways and it has nothing to do with what the meeting was about? Anyone ever been in one of those before? Yeah, I, I know I have. And that's not a statement on our staff here or anything like that. I just know when you get people together, it happens. And if you've ever been in those meetings and you're thinking to yourself, why am I here Like, this doesn't have anything to do with me or what I do or any of those things. And hopefully at some point, someone in the meeting says these classic words. Hey, everyone, let's go back to the beginning because the reason we're all here today, and then they launch into the meeting. It's like, finally, we got back to what really matters. I've been in those meetings I've led the meetings down into rabbit holes. I've also corrected the meetings and brought them back on top. Right, I've done that. Well, we're gonna do something like that today because we're beginning a brand new series called Family Matters. And we're, over these next weeks, gonna be diving into the different parts and the different arenas of our relational networks, like family and friendship and marriage and singleness and parenting, and even the bigger part we play in God's own family. But I was running into kind of a snag, because we prayed over this and kind of put this on the calendar months and months and months ago, probably the beginning of the year. And as we started getting closer through the summer, I was just praying over this, like, how do you start this series? And oftentimes, a family series starts with, with marriage or different things like that. And I just, I was just kind of praying and thinking about it. It's like, that's the wrong place to start. And I believe we need a foundation before we can actually launch into it. Because we can't just start with marriage or singleness or how to build healthy relationship or God's design for sex. At least we can't go there yet because it seems like the only way we can do this real justice is to go back to the very beginning and ask the bigger questions. Questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What have I built my life on? Because if we don't have an understanding and a solid foundation in our own lives, then our relationships and our families and our very identity becomes something that is shifting and moving to the whims of my own desires or, or the culture's demands. And I think we've all seen this, right? 
When we don't have a real foundation, then whoever's got the loudest voice, whoever's got the most influence, tends to, to shift our lives a little bit. I read a quote recently that said this, I set my alarm to tell me when to get up, but some days I need an alarm to tell me why I should get up. Ever had that moment in the morning? Like, I know I should get up. The question is, why am I getting up right now, right? Goes to a deeper place in us because all of us need a foundation. There's a guy named Jeff Myers who wrote a book and here's what he wrote. He said, we have passed a tipping point. A majority now say that truth is up to the individual and that ultimate truth cannot be known. Learning to speak our own truths was supposed to lead to dignity and harmony, and instead, our society struggles with unprecedented levels of social conflict, purposelessness, and a loss of identity. Does that ring true to you? It, it is to me that we as a culture struggle with social conflict, we're seeing that all around us, purposelessness, and people not even really knowing who, who really am I and why am I here? And in this book, he shares some alarming stats, things like 75% of those polled in this survey say that they are unsure of their purpose in life, 75%. And 50% believe there is no absolute value associated with human life. Human life is what it is. It's, it's a convenience, but it's okay if it doesn't exist. It's just, that's what, that's what we're wrestling with as a culture. And then he writes this. Our real cultural crisis is a catastrophic culture-wide loss of meaning. Now we're living with the existential results of a culture, listen to this, untethered from God and therefore untethered from any fixed reference point for truth, morality, identity, and meaning. What, what, what's he saying there? He's saying that we no longer have an anchor that draws us back to what is true and what is right. That in, off, in, in too many situations, we're, we're adrift, at least as a culture, trying to find meaning and purpose in so many different things because we have untethered, we've untied ourselves from God and, his, and the truth that is universal. And instead, we've just been on this, this adventure, this, this seeking of, of our own, what is true for me? And it's left us in this wild, chaotic place. And so what we're gonna do today and this has been my prayer, is that we would start by being re-tethered to God, that we would once again find our anchor point, our fixed point that we can now center our lives around, and it's Jesus and his truth and his life. And then we find the Bible becomes our source and our guidebook for us to go, this is what is right and this is what is true. And it's all leading us to a relationship with him. But if we don't start there, then all the information about marriage and singleness and family and sex and you know, any of those things, it's just gonna be like, well, okay, that's good for you, but it's not good for me. Or I don't believe, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something else. I'm gonna go on a different path. But if we really believe that God is the one and only, that he is the one who's given us truth, that he's the one who ordains purpose and direction in our lives, then we're gonna look to him for the answers in this. And so that's where we're gonna start. So it may seem a little odd. It may seem like, man, family matters. We're not really talking about family much because we have to start at this foundation place. So we're gonna start with this. Write this down. Number one, God made me to reflect him. God made me to reflect him. Now, in Genesis 1, we have these famous words that, that start the whole thing right. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And we see in the verses after this, the, the kind of cascade event of creation of, of all of the things. And this all comes in this first chapter. God's creative design and his work, designing earth, sun, moon, and stars, the oceans, the fish, birds, and animals, and all the plant life. So he has laid all this out and earth is teeming with life. And then we get to verses 26 and 27, and this is where we're gonna focus. 
And here's what it says. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And they will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, I want you to go back up to the first part of that. And the verse 26 begins, then God says, and to me, maybe just dramatic a little bit. I can imagine in this moment that there is this holy pause, this solemn pause after God had formed the earth and created all in its, in its entirety. And it's sitting there again, teeming with life. And as he considers this next move, it's almost like, in fact, there's a song that says, you know, all creation holds its breath. It's like, here's this moment. And he creates man and woman. And anticipation builds as we hear what God is going to do. Let us make human beings. And that first sentence is a little bit odd because it says, let us make. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And this us is used several times and it's an early revealing of the Trinity. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit operating in perfect unity and in perfect agreement that they're going to create human beings, male and female, Adam and Eve specifically. And they said, in our image. Now, humans were the last of God's created creatures, and they're the crowning achievement of all that he has done. Animals were made according to their own kinds, but human beings, it says, were created really in a class above all the rest of creation, that we are the peak of God's creative genius. And in addition, the creation of man and woman is narrated in even greater emphasis in chapter two, and we're not going to look into that. But if you were to turn to Genesis 2, you see the creation of man and woman all over again. And some people read that and go, hold on, did God do this twice or what's really happening? It was a way in Hebrew literature of emphasizing importance. And so in greater detail and in greater nuance, we see it explained one more time. And no other part of creation is given this much attention. It is us as humanity, male and female. And from the very beginning, the, this human existence is defined in these two ways, man and woman, male and female. And I know, I know this has become a hot button issue in our culture. But understand that the Bible and science and all of history stands in agreement that our sexual identity is a reflection of God's perfection in God's creation. And that this right here at the beginning of the Bible is, is the truth from God himself, that he created us male and female. And we express that with humility and we express it with grace. And then we see three times we're told that God created humans and the fact that we are made in his image is emphasized twice, that you and I are not the result of a coincidental cosmic accident. We have not somehow evolved from a single cell organism over the space of millions of eons. You are more than just matter and you matter greatly to the almighty God. And since you and I are the product of God's intentional divine design that we have been given dignity and value and worth and purpose. Every single human being is given dignity and value and worth. Our, our first purpose then comes from this phrase where God says, let us make human beings in our image. And this word image in the Hebrew, it refers to like a statue or a model meant to show an image of somebody or something, something that would be very lifelike. So we would consider like a sculpture. I don't know if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., and you've gone along the mall there, and at one end is the Washington Monument, and the other end is the Lincoln Memorial. And if you walk up all those steps to the Lincoln Memorial, 
And I know you've seen pictures of it. And Abraham Lincoln is, is sitting, you know, on this, this big chair, kind of like a throne, and he's looking straight ahead. And it is so lifelike. I mean, you see the veins on his hands. You see the indentation of even just like wrinkle. I mean, it's just crazy how lifelike it is. It's almost so lifelike. You wonder at some point if he's like looking at you. You know, is that, is he looking at me? That'd be weird. But of course, no, that doesn't happen because the Abraham Lincoln Memorial is just a statue. It's a representation of the man. But God didn't make us to be statues. We are alive and we're responsive. And the doctrine around this whole idea of us made in the image of God is summed up in this Latin phrase called imago Dei. Imago Dei. And it means the image of God. And what does it mean for us to be made in God's image? I mean, since he is spirit, he doesn't have flesh and blood and bones and muscle he doesn't have a digestive tract and lungs. And so like, what does it mean to be made in God's image? It, it means that, that we are a reflection of his nature and of his character. And so we reflect him in so many ways. Now think about what this means. It means that because we're a reflection of God himself, we are able as human beings to express virtues like truth and love and kindness, and goodness, and compassion, and wisdom, and holiness, and justice. And it sets us apart from all the rest of creation. As human beings, we have been given dignity. As human beings, we have been given a unique personality. Now, you may have a best friend that you would say, we are so much alike it is scary. Like, we like all the same things. We like hanging out with them. I mean, you can just go down through the list. And it's like, you are absolutely right, but you are unique. You're not exactly like anyone else. Your fingerprints, your iris, all these things are unique expressions of your one-of-a-kind creation and your one-of-a-kind personality. There is no one like you. We also, as human beings, have the ability to be self-conscious. And I don't mean that in a way like, oh, I'm embarrassed about something, but we are conscious, we are aware of ourselves. That's unique in all of creation that we, we can think about ourselves in a detached kind of way. We can think about our motivations and why we do what we do. We can think about the things that drive us. We can think about the future and tomorrow and what that's gonna maybe look like. We can plan things in our life. There is a awareness of the self that God has made in us. And we've been given the ability to communicate with words, with expressions, even through something as interesting as sign language, right? We have found ways to communicate with one another. As human beings, we can think logically and we can use reason. Some of you are going, you should meet my friend. It is not, there's no logic, there's no reason. I, I know sometimes we don't, but we, we have the ability to reason things out and to think things through. We have a conscience and we know what is right and wrong. We don't always act in those ways, but there is built within us this sense of Things not being right and things being wrong. If you've ever let, read C.S. Lewis' book, Mere Christianity, he goes into this in depth, how it is actually uh, an indicator of a creator that we innately, and you can go into places around the world, there are things that globally, over history, people have just thought, no, that's not right, that's, that's wrong. We have this innate sense of that, and that's our conscience. That's the Holy Spirit at work within us. And we have a soul, and we have a spirit, and we have a will. So I want you to hear this. Because, because we are image bearers of God, we are image bearers of God, our purpose is to reflect him and his character in who we are and in what we do. Let me say that again. Because we are image bearers, that imago Dei, the image of God in us, our purpose is to reflect him and his character in who we are, but also in what we do. This is why, 
This is why we start at this place when we look at things like relationships and marriage and family and children and sex and sexuality because we reflect the image of our creator, God. And so then the question is, so what does God desire in those things? What is God's heart around marriage and singleness and sex and family and parenting and kids? What is his heart? What are his intentions? So that we know what we should do and how we can live honoring him in a world that is crazy. When we build our lives on him, he gives us direction on how to do those things. And that's why this is so important. Because if we don't see ourselves as being made in the image of God, if we don't see ourselves as, as people who live out his desires and his characteristics in the things that matter most to us, we're just gonna live however we want. And God has something so much more for us, not just rules and regulations, but life, abundant life, life in its fullness. That's what he has for us. So write this down for number two. God wants every part of my life. I'm gonna save you a, uh, a Google study of a part of the Bible. There is not a single verse in the Bible, not a single one, that says you can follow after God or follow after Jesus and live your life any way you want to. There's not a single verse that says, yeah, 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 just come to God and then just live however you want. Not a single verse. And the reason is, is because God wants all of you. He's not satisfied with 10% of you. He's not satisfied with 50% of you. He's not satisfied with 99% of you. He wants all of you because you matter that much to him, because you are his treasure. You are his masterpiece. And he's, it's not that God looks at us if we're, you know, given 99% and going, hey, I'm trying to figure out that last 1%. God's not angry. He's, he's, not, he's not condemning us in any way. It's just that he desires every part of us. And God is very clear about this. There's no mystery. Look what it says in Romans 6.13. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. If you have your sheet there, here's what I want you to do. I want you to underline or circle two things. Underline uh, completely and then underline whole body. See, it's, it's all of you. It's all of you. And by the way, if you missed the message last week, I really would encourage you to go onto YouTube and, and watch it. And I talked about the difference between our intellectual believing. Yeah, I, b I believe there's God. I believe there was a Jesus that lived. And Jesus, all through the Bible, not saying just simply believe, but come follow me. Come follow me, come, come know me. So I really encourage you to do that because it comes back to this. Jesus invited us to follow him, to be an apprentice to him, to know him, to learn from him and to walk with him, to do what he did. And this is the critical decision. I mentioned C.S. Lewis a few moments ago. If you don't know who he is, uh, he passed away actually in, in 1962, I think, or three. And uh, but he, was, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, these kids' books that are really an allegory about Jesus. Uh, but he was also a theologian, a philosopher, all these different things. And here's, here's what C.S. Lewis wrote. He said, the only thing that Christianity cannot be, cannot be, is moderately important. The only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. What's he saying? He's saying, if it's true, it deserves everything you've got. If it's true, then it should shape and mold every decision and every choice that you make around your goals, your finances, your relationships, your career, sex, everything. It should inform every decision that we make. But so many times we're trying to sit on the fence saying, well, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Like, what, what does God want me to do? What does God want me to be? How is my life going to be shaped. And here's what the Bible says. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? 
There's the question. What does God want? He requires only that you fear the Lord your God and live in a way that pleases him and love him and serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Our struggle is, is that we, we like to divide, at least mentally, we like to divide up our life in a nice, clean, pie-shaped things in our life, right? So our life is the whole. And so we're gonna have our work slice. So here's this piece of my life. Or if you're a student, here's my school life. And then I have relationships and family and maybe sex and finances. And then I have this slice over here, which is the spiritual side of myself. As if you could center your spiritual life around one little slice. See, here's the deal. We're integrated every single one of us. Think about this. When something's going wrong in a relationship and there's conflict there, how do you do at work? I'll bet it affects your work. And if something's really kind of messed up at work and it's taking all your time and energy, how does that affect your spiritual life? When you're financially strapped or strained, how does that affect your other relationships? How does it affect school? See, we're, we're integrated people. And and the crazy thing is, is, is we try to divide up, but, but we really can't. So here's the question. What is going to be first place in your life? What is going to be the priority that drives your entire life? Who are you going to follow? Because you are following someone or something. What truth are you going to center your life around? Is it going to be the truth and life of your creator, or is it gonna be what culture tells you? And I will tell you, it's changing faster than ever around culture. Here's what the wisest man in the world wrote, King Solomon. He said, trust in the Lord your God with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding, but seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Seek his will, seek his ways in all that you do. So when it comes to what we're going to be looking at this month in Family Matters, relationships, marriage, sex, family, singleness, parenting, purity, integrity, morality, who will you trust and who will you depend on? It's really an invitation from God to live holy lives in every arena. Write this down for the last one. God created me to live in holiness and purity. Holiness and purity. I love this definition of holiness. Being holy is the whole of Christ in the whole of my life. By the way, whole there is with a W, right? All of Christ in all of my life. One person put it this way. Holiness is the complete acceptance of the will of God. But regardless, however you want to define it, can I tell you this? Please, please, please don't ever think that holiness is simply an option in following Jesus. It is the pivotal point on which the whole of Christianity turns. Paul wrote this long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us to, in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. It takes us right back to the Genesis creation again. Long before Genesis 1-1 exploded onto the scene, in the beginning, God was already loving and choosing you and I as his own. And every person who responds to the good news is responding to holiness. And it's not just a few people. It's not just those that, well, they're really holy, but I'm just regular me. No, holiness and purity is what God desires and also what he requires for all of us. And if God desires that, then God's gonna give us the ability to achieve it with him. Because when you get right down to it, right down to the basics, it comes down to obedience, to know his truth and to walk in it, to have his truth inform every decision we make and in every circumstance we choose his way. Loving God, really loving God, following Jesus as an apprentice means obeying him no matter what the cost And I will tell you, when we choose to walk God's way, it's gonna be a little radical. But it's what will give us ultimate joy and fulfillment and purpose and hope. That's why Jesus told his disciples this, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. But how do we get to the point where we place obedience to God over personal gain or personal comfort or personal desire or or what everyone else is telling us to do? 
Paul gave the believers in Rome some practical advice. Here's what he said. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will accept. And when you think of what he's done for you, is this too much to ask? I want to read that same passage in the message translation. It has a little different feel to it, a little different edge to it. Listen to what he says. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life. And let me add this, your relationships, your marriage, your singleness, your parenting, your sex, take all those things and you place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. I think this is the place we start. I think this is the place we begin. Why we were created and what are God's intentions and how do we live in light of that? Because until we get that foundation down, we'll be tossed all over the place by what our culture and the media and the world is gonna tell us. But you were created to reflect God. He made you to love you. And he wants every arena of your life. And he invites you to walk in obedience in holiness and in purity. Because when I embrace what God does and what he desires, it's the best thing that I can do. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, today we thank you that you love us so much, that your intentions towards us are good. Your desires are for us to experience your presence and your joy and, and abundance in life. And yet, Lord, what we hear and what we see in culture and in the world keeps trying to turn our heads and pull us in different directions. Just do what you want and do what you desire. But Lord, you have something better for us, something more. And I pray, Lord, that we would choose today your way. We would choose today your truth, the truth of the one who made us and made all that there is. And God, in that, we would find more than we could ever imagine in our families, in our relationships, our friendships, our marriages. God, in all of this, Lord, we would find your desires and your heart. So I thank you, Lord, as we prepare for this, this month of looking at these, these really important things, that we would come back to that. Lord, we want your way over our way. So we thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Hey, if, uh, if you're here today and you go, you know, I'm facing some tough things. Maybe it's around this idea of relationships and family and you would like someone to pray for you. We have this prayer corner over here and we have some folks that would love to just stand with you. You don't have to confess anything. There's no big explanation, but they would love just to pray with you and to stand with you as uh, you walk through whatever it is and know that they're there for you today. But for each of us, here's my challenge for you as you go. I wanna challenge you this week to take a moment, quiet moment, and, and just ask yourself, what have I built my life on? What is the foundation of my life? What have I trusted more than everything else to guide and direct me? And be honest. And maybe it's been your career or relationship, maybe it's been a whole host of things. But God's inviting you today to put your faith and trust in him, to build on him. And Jesus even said, if we will build on him, that when the storms of life come, we will stay standing. You can trust him in this. Hey, thanks so much for being here today. God bless you. Go and be lights in this world. <laughs>